Oh, wow. Hey, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'm really excited to present this uh, Canadian-made Singer 1591 to you today. As most of you know, the uh, 1591s were made basically at two locations. They were made in Elizabethport, New Jersey, and they were made in, or I should say they were finished in Canada. Canada did a lot of finishing for machines that were coming either from the UK or from <clears throat> over in Scotland. They would supply motors and, uh, and other parts for the machines to kind of finish them off. So <clears throat> and this particular machine belongs to, <clears throat> excuse me, Kathy Maddox, Kathy Maddox out of Clemens, North Carolina. So I'm really excited to show you this Canadian version of the 1591 because I've never done it on this channel before. Oddly enough, I've never had a chance to present a Canadian 1591 to you before. And they're going to be real similar, but there are a couple of unique differences uh, as far as the mechanics of the machine and the parts that they used. And one of the really fun things to mention about... Oh, hey, good morning, Paula. One of the really interesting things to mention about this Canadian 1591 is that when the upper tension is torn apart, you discover that there's actually one piece that holds the take-up spring that actually is gold-plated. How cool is that? I have no idea why they chose to gold-plate it, but they did. And I actually captured that in some of my progress shots, so that's kind of neat. And there's a lot of different manufacturers that use gold or at least gold plating. They use it in electronics. They use it in a variety of other fields uh, because it's really a great material uh, to work with, although it is a little bit more costly, a little bit more costly. All right, so let's go ahead and stitch down again, and then I'll let you look at these uh, stitches a little bit closer up. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and really reduce the uh, stitch length size. I started out right around six or seven stitches per inch. We're taking it all the way down to close to 20 stitches per inch. So you'll be able to see the dramatic contrast between our first stitch line and the second. Now, let me ask any of you that are part of the live stream right now, what year was the first year that the 1591 was introduced? Does anyone remember? What, what was the first year that the 1591 was introduced? And while you're typing that into the chat, I'm going to go ahead and launch down another stitch row here. <clears throat> and also listen to the machine as well. I didn't shut the music off. The music cut out again like it's been doing. But it gives you a chance to really hone in and listen to this machine and just how silky smooth it runs now. Oh, that's such a fun contrast between the two rows. Such a fun contrast. And welcome to uh, Renee as well. Renee has kind of stepped into the uh, the chat. And I don't know that I've seen the name Renee before. So, Renee, if, if you're comfortable, you have to let us know maybe what what state or country you're from. And uh, we, can, uh, we can make you feel welcome as part of this live stream where we're having a chance for the first time on this YouTube channel. We're having the first opportunity to see a Canadian 1591 do its magical dance uh, at this premiere. Now, here's a little bit of a look at the uh, stitching. Hopefully you can see that. This camera that I'm using now is a razor camera, and it's doing a lot better than the previous one. But it's still, you know, when you're trying to get focused in on something this close, it can be a little bit tricky for the for the camera to try to capture it. But I'll kind of go up and down a little bit, and hopefully you're going to be able to see that stitching. It's absolutely page 34 stitching. And if you're brand new to this channel and you're saying page 34 what? <laughs> 
Page 34 means a near perfect stitch. I always say um, there's no such thing as a perfect stitch. And I know that uh, others might take issue with that statement, but there's always a way to improve stitch quality, whether it's the, the type or the quality of thread you're using, the needle selection. Uh, it could be uh, the type of presser foot attachment you have on the machine. It could be how you have the feed dogs adjusted, how you have the stitch um, tension, uh, upper tension, lower tension calibrated. There's so many things that play into the, the quality and the consistency of stitching that when you go through uh, a stitch length variation like this of about six stitches per inch, all the way down to about 20 stitches per inch, it really puts that machine to the test to see if it can maintain <clears throat> maintain stitch integrity and stitch quality. And obviously, Kathy Maddox's 1949 uh, Singer 1591 out of Canada did a brilliant job. It's exactly what we want to be seeing as far as stitch quality and stitch caliber. I'm going to move this camera back a little bit, see if I can get even get a better picture of that for you. Yeah, that's a little bit better. A little bit less glary. We flip it over and we have a chance to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, look at the lock stitch. You're not going to see any difference. And I say it all the time on this channel. The lock stitch is always going to be more difficult for the machine to produce a page 34 style stitch. It's going to be, always be a little bit more challenging, a little bit more difficult because that needle has to catch that hook and pull that thread back up through these two layers of 100% cotton and through this stiffener that I have in the middle as well. And this stiffener is almost like a cardboard material. It does a real nice job of holding that material stable when it's feeding through uh, these two very thin layers of 100% cotton. So, but the proof is in the pudding when you look at the quality and the caliber. Well, that's better. There's actually a light on this camera. There's uh, like a ring light on this camera and the light was on, which I thought, hey, the, why not have the light on? But I just shut it off and now you can see see that without that wavering across the screen, which is really annoying. So that's our lock stitch again, our top stitch. Absolutely, as we want to be seeing it. Let me take a look at the chat real quick. I think that there's a couple of a couple of questions that uh, have been asked. Let me see if I can respond to those. Oh, I love my Texas people. Welcome from uh, from the Fort Worth, Texas area, Renee. It's great to have you here. Great to have you here. So what I did for what I did for this Singer 1591, this machine again was shipped to the workshop from Clemens, North Carolina. It had been in storage for quite a while. And so there was just a lot of issues with the machine um, as far as being frozen up. Some of the wiring had degraded. So there was rewiring involved. There was deep cleaning uh, involved as well because there was also some rust uh, that had built up inside of the machine. When you store a machine, even in some of these fancy places that say they're climate controlled, depending on the type of machine, it can still develop rust. And uh, that certainly is the case with this 1949 uh, Canadian-made Singer 1591. So yeah, complete service, rewiring, uh, reworking the motor as well. The motor had some issues going on with it. And then just a complete, I call it the workshop magic. It's from bobbing the balance wheel, going through that machine, adjusting, uh, cleaning, and just doing everything necessary to get that machine to a point where nothing is holding it back. So that's what I do in my process. It's a very lengthy process. 
And I don't know of anybody else in the world that goes to the depth that I do. I call it the surgical level of, of servicing a machine so that it performs. And, I, and I've been told this by people that used to go door to door with singers, kind of like the Fuller Brushmen. Um, I've been told by people they've reached out to me. As a matter of fact, I interviewed one of them that is from North Carolina many, many, uh, a number of years ago. And he said, your machines perform better than the ones that we got directly from the factory and that we took into people's homes to try to demonstrate them and sell that machine to that individual. And so that's really a, a compliment I take to heart. I'm constantly trying to improve the processes of what I do with these machines. I don't want to make them just run or even stitch well. I want them to, to run effortlessly so that that owner, when they get the machine back, like Kathy out in Clemens, North Carolina, she can enjoy this machine worry-free uh, for hopefully the rest of her life. It's going to continue to perform day after day after day for her and do what it's supposed to do because of the depth of the service and uh, the repairs that I took this machine through. And we'll look at some of those progress shots. I believe I counted roughly uh, that I posted about 300 progress shots of Kathy Maddox's Canadian 1591. And those are all the things that I've done to it. What do I discover? How do I change it? How do I improve it? How do I restore it? I try to capture as much of that as possible so that the owner, first of all, can look at that and go, holy cow, I didn't know you did all that to the machine. I didn't know that it needed all of that. Uh, but also to anyone else that see those sees those pictures uh, can go, wow, that really is a different process. It's different than any process that I've ever seen. And I have people from around the world that tell me that. So I, I feel pretty confident that I've got a a good process that I take these machines through. And it ultimately comes down to this, doesn't it? <clears throat> it comes down to during this uh, live stream, we're going to be stitching through a wide variety of different materials. And I should, I should rewind a little bit and tell you about the setup that we have today on this machine. And the setup is we've got uh, a 9014 universal Schmetz needle. And then on top, We've got Coates and Clark dual duty thread and dual duty thread is, is used in quilting. It's used in all sewing applications. It's really one of those really versatile threads that uh, Coates and Clark came out with so that people would, could use it over a wide variety of types of sewing projects. So that's our setup. Now, when you're setting this machine up, let me give you a couple tips on it so that you can set it up successfully. Number one, when you're setting the needle on this class 15 machine, you want to make sure that the flat side of the needle is pointing to the left. So when you slide the needle into the needle socket, make sure you get it all the way in. These 1591s, especially the Canadian ones, the needle bar setup on this is a little bit different than its uh, American counterpart. And so you can get that needle about three quarters of the way in <clears throat> and it feels like it's all the way in the socket. And then you give it a little bit of a jiggle wiggle and then it slides in a good mil millimeter or another millimeter and a half. And you can say, well, gosh, is, is a millimeter or a millimeter and a half really that big of a deal? It really is with the oscillating hook system on this machine. We're not dealing with a rotary hook system that's going to be passing by and catching that thread more rapidly. On the oscillating hook system, it's going to be pivoting back and forth like a pendulum. And so it becomes a lot more critical where that needle is intersecting with that hook as it comes up and rotates back down again. So when you set that needle, make sure you get it all the way up into that needle socket on, on the needle bar, especially if you have a Canadian version of the 1591. And if you weren't part of the live stream near the beginning. The other cool thing about this machine, and I did mention it already, is on the a number of the Canadian versions, they changed the components in the upper tension slightly, and the, the mounting uh, stem that becomes part of this assembly that the take-up spring is attached to on this particular machine is actually gold-plated. 
And gold is used, as I mentioned earlier on in the live stream, is used in a number of different industries. It wasn't commonly used with sewing machines, but there were a few manufacturers, domestic, some machines made by white before they went to Japan, and also some of these Canadian uh, machines as well on certain components like the upper tension, instead of using a standard uh, metal or uh, maybe a, a, a copper, they would use uh, gold plating. And gold plating has a lot of advantages when it comes to being in a mechanism like the upper tension. So uh, they had their reasons for doing it. And also it gives them a little bit, little bit of a bragging right, doesn't it? Oh, hey, hey, Emma, welcome. And uh, F FTF, the pictures that I post are going to be on the Cow Country Facebook page. I usually post them in groups of around 40 to 50 pictures each. So if you go to Facebook and you search Cow Country Vintage Sewing, uh, you'll see Kathy Maddox's uh, photo groups, her photo group sets, uh, posted there. I believe there was a total of seven of them and each one has about 40 to 50 photos. So, I mean, it gives you an idea of, you know, the, the, it gives you an idea of some of the processes that I take the machine through, but the, the big deal is that's only a portion of the pictures that capture some of the processes. So there's obviously a lot more steps, a lot more servicing, a lot more restoration that's done to a machine like this to get it ready for this live stream that I even captured in those 300 plus photos that I posted on Facebook. But I, I do that because I, I want the owner and I want others to see the difference in what's done at the workshop here compared to what's done at more of a standard sewing vac service type center place where they're going to spend about 45 minutes to an hour on your machine here at the workshop on a machine like this. It could be as long as 14 to 17 hours when you count up all the time that's spent going through all those different progress steps to get this machine ready. So I, I want people to understand that. I want them to understand why the process is different. I want them to understand some of the differences of what I do compared to others out there. So. Okay, so let's do some more sewing on this uh, on this machine. The other thing I should tell you is that there are certain uh, countries of manufacturing origin, origin that Singer used, like the St. John's plant in Canada, where they didn't do as meticulous of a job of tracking the dating of the machines. They would use brackets instead of using a pinpoint birth date like we talk about on this channel all the time. And uh, so when it came to dating this machine, uh, there were a couple of things that I looked at in order to try to narrow it down. Uh, but the original bracket that I started with on this Canadian 1591 was that the machine was born somewhere, according to Canadian records, was born somewhere between 1948 and 1954. That's a pretty big gap. That's like a six year window of the Canadian saying, based on the serial number of this machine, which, if you want to look it up yourself or do a little bit of research, the serial number on Kathy's machine is J as in Juliet, C as in Charlie, 733535. I'll type that into the chat right now so that you can see that serial number. But the Canadians, like some other countries, they don't do a, they don't have meticulous record keeping when it comes to the manu the specific manufacturing birth date of machines. They bracket them, and so again, the bracket on this machine was somewhere between 1948 and 1954. But as I looked at the attributes of the machine and tore the machine down, I felt pretty comfortable in giving it a, a date uh, a date birth date a date birthday, a birthday year of 1949. So let me type that uh, serial number into the chat.
So I just posted the serial number. If you want to look, do some looking yourself, you'll discover that uh, the Canadian Singer plant uh, didn't track things quite as closely as, say, machines that came out of Kilbawi, Scotland, machines that came out of Elizabethport, New Jersey, or machines that came out of Anderson, South Carolina. And there's obviously a lot more manufacturing locations around the world that Singer used. Uh, and, uh, and they also would sometimes manage record keeping a little bit differently. So you kind of discover that as you deal with a wide scope of machines that, uh, those best practices that should have been carried out by all of the manufacturing locations were not always carried out incredibly well. And then you've got unique situations like the plants that were in France that manufactured a number of different machines that lost the records the original records that would have given the dating of the machines were just simply lost. They're, they're gone forever as far as they've been able to determine. So when you're trying to donate, when you're trying to date singer uh, machines that were made in France, it's nearly impossible uh, other than, you know, trying to bracket it out a little bit and get kind of a, a general guess as to when that machine may have been made. <clears throat> All right. So let me do this. Let me try to get a little bit of music on because I'm a music guy, as most of you know. And it may stop and start, and that's okay. So some of the other materials that I have for us to sew today... Excuse me. We've been having a lot of temperature fluctuations, and it kind of messes with uh, messes with your nasal and your voice and everything else. So, if my voice sounds a little bit different than it usually does, we've been having temperature fluctuations between sub-zero and thirty to forty degrees outside. So it kind of goofs around with you a little bit. So some of the things we have that we can sew during this live stream today is. We've got a wide variety of leathers. Um, I love sewing leathers because it really does put that machine to the test. I've got genuine elk hide. I've got protected full grain leather. I've got saddle grade leather. I've got uh, double checking here because they're real close. I've got what looks to be uh, Italian leather. And then I also have some... Um, Vegetable tan leather as well. This is a, a an unusual color for, but vegetable tan leather. So what leather would you like me to try sewing first? If you want to type in uh, the chat, give me your opinion. Again, we've got elk hide, protected full grain leather, saddle grade leather. Uh, looks like an Italian style leather. And then we've got uh, vegetable tan leather on the very bottom. So... If you want to see one of these done first, type it in the chat. Let your voice be heard, and I'll sew that to that particular leather first. And then we've got denim, we've got fake leather, we've got a rubberized material, um, we've got uh, acrylic fiber. I love to do a, a sewing Olympics on machines when I'm presenting them. So it's not just sewing one, you know, one type of leather or one type of material. It's taking that machine and running it through a, a whole matrix of different uh, fabrics. So you can see that that machine can handle it because a lot of people have misconceptions based on what they've read on Facebook or other places like that as to what a machine like a 1591 is suitable for sewing on. I really like to open up people's eyes and show them this is what you can do. You can pretty much sew anything once that machine is optimized. Oh, hey, Bry guy. Welcome, Bry Guy. Good to have you. Okay, well, it looks like we got one vote for elk hide. So let's go after the elk hide. Let me set these to the side. We'll do a single layer first. And you should know, you should know straight away that elk hide is chemically processed, which means when they process a hide like this, they use a chemical process to galvanize the surface of that leather so that it's more durable, it's more resistant to staining, very much like the protected full grain leather. So, but the, the big deal here is that a single layer of this stuff 
is right around three to four ounces of leather. That's equivalent of about two to three millimeters thickness. There are some belts that I've seen that are not this thick. So it's not an easy task, even for this Canadian 1591, but I think you're going to be impressed at how easily it gets the job done after it's gone through my process and gotten a little dose of the workshop magic. You can see it from the side right there. It's crazy thick. So another quick little tip for you, because I get this question quite often, is my machine my machine kind of binds up a little bit when I launch initially for sewing. And sometimes it'll, it'll get the uh, bird nesting on the bottom. What can I do to try to reduce that from happening? There's two things you can do, especially on a machine that has an oscillating hook system. Number one, when you initially launch, you can just for a, a brief second hold onto that thread when you're launching and then let her go. Once you've gotten one or two stitches down, you're good to go. The other thing you can do so that there's no mechanical binding on the machine is you always want to make sure that that take-up arm is at the highest position and ideally that it's on the downstroke. In other words, if I turn that balance wheel just a hair more, you're going to notice right away that 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 take-up arm begins to pitch down. See that? So those are two simple little tips so that you can overcome some of the issues that people fight all the time. And these are even experienced seamstresses that I've gotten on the phone with, where after I've explained those two little tips, they sound like little kids on the other side. And they're like, I can't believe it. I've been battling this for years. I've been battling this for years. And those two little tips help them to overcome that challenge. Isn't that cool when we can share knowledge and we can do something like that? I think so. And that's part of the beauty of this classroom is we do it all the time. I learn from you. You learn from me. Sometimes a teacher, always a student, right? I say it all the time. So take up arms at the highest position. Let's try a single layer of this genuine elk hide. And then we're going to double it. We're going to go from a single layer to two. All right. Are you ready? All right. Here we go. Once I get my foot on the foot controller here, hold on. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? <laughs> I forgot to change the stitch length. So we just lay down a near satin stitch through about four to five ounces of genuine elk hide. That was not my plan, but we just did it anyway. And I'll tell you straight away, to maintain stitch integrity through this much leather, sewing a stitch line that tight, around 15 to 20 stitches per inch, it's not an easy task. And yet we just did it. And we did it without a hand start. That's a big deal too. That's a real big deal. Let's take a look at this and then we'll adjust the stitch length and I'll lay down one other line of stitching next to it. Oh, that's funny. I sometimes make things even more challenging, but the machine after I've gotten done with it is up to the task. So that's the cool side of things. All right, let me shut the little light off on the camera again. So this is our stitch line we just laid down. Again, about 15 to 20 stitches per inch through three quarters. Um, well, probably not three quarters. Through about three, three millimeters of genuine elk hide. And you can see the stitch quality the, the spacing, the formation of the stitch, the integrity of the stitch, the glory of the stitch, as I like to say, is just absolutely as it should be. Absolutely as it should be. We flip it over. Let's look at that lock stitch. See what we think of that lock stitch. I've got to pull that a little bit there. This is our lock stitch. Now, again, whenever you're executing a lock stitch on a machine and that thread has to work its way up through this thick leather, it's a lot more difficult to get a quality lock stitch than it is a top stitch any day of the week, any day of the week. And yet Kathy's 1949 Canadian made Singer 1591 
just lay down absolute page 34 stitching on this genuine elk hide. So now let's do this. Let's step up the difficulty even higher. A single layer is a fair test to show that the machine is ready to get the job done. You know what? I promised you I'd, I would do one more stitch line on this though first. Hold on a second. Let me adjust that stitch length back to six to seven stitches per inch. And let's sew down this single layer of genuine elk hide one more time. So we can see it do its little dance and, and then look at those stitches side by side. All right, you ready? Here we go. Now, did you notice when I launched into that, I had done all the right things. But again, this needle that we're using right now, this 9014 Schmetz Universal Needle, has already gotten quite a bit of a workout. As I've done the stitching uh, testing on it, after I got done with the servicing and restoration, um, I used the same needle. So it's starting to, you know, it's starting to show a little bit of a sign of being getting a little bit tired. That's why it hit that uh, elk hide and, and there was just a brief little pause. But again, I launched into that with no hand start. So hand starting on leather sometimes is almost a given. But look at that stitching. If that helps or hurts, I'm going to turn that little light on again. Absolutely beautiful stitching. We turn it over, there's no difference when we look at that lock stitch. That's our lock stitch that we just did with uh, a stitch line of about six to seven stitches per inch. Hey, Susie, welcome, Susie. <clears throat> I'm just glancing at the screen. I believe that that's Susie from Minnesota. So welcome from Minnesota. So beautiful stitching, both stitch lines. Again, look at the side of what we just went through. A single layer of elk hide, but it's the thickness of a man's belt. And now what we're going to do is we're going to double and sew through two layers of this with Kathy's uh, Singer 1591. I love to do stuff like this because... I get notes from people all around the world and they'll say, I didn't know that that particular machine model could sew at that level and lay down stitching that beautiful. So I love to not only just talk about it and say it's possible, I love to show it at premieres or live streams like this so people can actually say, hey, you got to watch this video. I was told that this machine could not sew something like this. These are the two layers that we're about to go through. I was told that a 1591 could not sew at this level. So what do I do? I spend a lot of time prepping that machine, getting it so that it's able to do what some people think is impossible and do it with absolute ease. So this is our next sew off right here. Two layers of genuine elk hide. And uh, we'll probably do, um, you know what I might do for Kathy is I might stitch down the left side and then leave most of the leather open. So when she gets it out in North Carolina, she can stitch down this as well. A lot of customers will do that. When I send, I'll send all of the sew offs that we've done on the live stream or the premiere, and then they can stitch down that same sew off that they watched on that live stream premiere. It's kind of fun, isn't it? You get to revisit what that machine is capable of doing. That's the fun side of things. And I think that's why people really enjoy seeing their machines presented because 
number one, it gives them a preview of what they can expect. And number two, it gives them a sense of, I'm going to do that when I get the machine. So I'll leave some space open and Kathy can sew down these two layers of genuine elk hide. What are we talking about here? We're talking about 12 to 14 ounces of leather that's chemically processed. 12 to 14 ounces of leather, folks. That's, I mean, look at it in the shot. That's, that's well beyond a man's belt and, or, or a woman's belt for that matter. We've got a lot of gals that love the thicker belts too. So I should clarify that straight away, but we're going to do this on this Canadian made 1591. So let's do it. We set this other saw off to the side. We'll get this machine all set up, get that take up arm in, in position. And I'm going to try this without a hand start because the motor, I went through the entire motor, did some rewiring as well. So it's a nice, strong motor. But I don't know. This is a lot of leather. I mean, look at it in the shot right now. That's a lot of leather. So I don't know. I might give it a little bit of a boost just to get it rolling. We'll see. So take up arms at the highest position. Let's give this a try and see how this... 1949 Canadian 1591 can manage this level of sewing on genuine elk hide. All right. All right. Take a deep breath. Here we go. <laughs> oh, it's fun, isn't it? It's fun giving people a new vision of what a machine is capable of. Yeah, it is. Here we go. I'm going to slow it down even a little bit. Slow it down, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. <laughs> and I have to tell you guys, I had my hand over by the balance wheel, just depending on what would the, you know, again, a tiring needle. What would the machine do when it ran into something like this? I didn't have to touch the balance wheel. This was without a hand start, without a hand start. That's mind blowing. I don't know of anyone else that has taken a 1591 Canadian made her otherwise and sewed at this level without using a hand start. It goes back to the fact that when you take a machine and you go through it from bobbing the balance wheel, guess what? You eliminate any obstacle that's potentially going to hold that machine back. That's what makes the machines that leave the workshop able to outperform other machines out there that could never hope to sew at that level. They just can't. They can dream about it, but they're not going to be able to do it. So let's look at the stitching now after all of that blah, blah, blah. And again, we're not, let me say this very clearly. We're not using a leather needle. We're not using a leather needle. We don't have the benefit of a leather needle point that has a cutting edge on it. That's what makes a leather needle. It's got a special blade cutting edge on that needle point. It's got a special shaft and a special long groove that's going to allow that needle to, to, to really punch through that leather more effectively. We're using a universal needle, and we just went through about 14 ounces of genuine elk hide without a hand start, without a hand start. And most importantly, not only do we do that, but we laid down stitching that in my opinion, going through that much leather, look at that, going through that much leather is absolutely brag worthy. This is beautiful, beautiful page 34 stitching with a tiring needle. That's not a leather needle. And yet this Canadian 1591 did it just like, okay, we're doing a sew-off. No big deal. Other machines would pass out. Other 1591s would hit that leather and with a hand start or without a hand start, they would never be able to get through this much leather. There's just no way. They wouldn't be able to do it. And Kathy's did it without a hand start, without a leather needle basic Coates and Clark dual duty thread and it laid down page 34 stitching. 
That's a big deal, folks. I hope you understand that. That's a big deal. Let me shut that light off again, see if that helps. There we go. Now it finally focused. All right, I showed you the front. Let's look at the lock stitch now. And again, when you're sewing through a, a thickness of leather like this, we might have to bump up that upper tension a little bit because, again, it's going to be more difficult for the machine to pull that thread back up through these two thick layers of genuine elk hide. But we'll look at these stitching and see how that balance was maintained through such a difficult sew-off. So all in all, a pretty good lock stitch. But I would be inclined to say that we could bump up the upper tension just slightly to define that lock stitch even more than it is now. We could certainly do that. Trying to adjust that light again in here. And I can show you, I can show you very easily, you know, when you look at the side, you can see that it's a nicely defined uh, lock stitch through all of this leather, but we can make it even better. I always talk about the Kanai principle, don't I? Constant and never ending improvement. So we can take what is a very, very passable uh, lock stitch through all of that leather and we can make it we can make it even better than it is by making a simple adjustment to that upper tension. So we'll stitch this one more time. We'll stitch this one more time. I'm gonna go ahead, right now we're at about, right at about four. I'm gonna take us up to about five. And we're gonna stitch this one more time and just see what impact we can bring. Again, when you're making tension adjustments, especially sewing at this level, you've got to be mindful that if you're trying to define that lock stitch more, you just don't want to go too far with the adjustment because what can happen then is it can start to take away the beauty and the definition of the top stitch. Remember, when it comes to tension adjustments, the upper tension unit, this unit right here, is pulling up to define that lock stitch. The bobbin case down below in here, there we go. The bobbin case down here is pulling down to define the top stitch. So when I just adjusted us from four to five on the upper tension, so we can get a little bit more pizzazz from that lock stitch, even though it's passable, uh, we don't want to go too far because then we'll take away from this top stitch. Make sense? So we got to balance it. We've got to keep that, keep that tug of war fair so that both sides can maintain a nice balance and equilibrium as far as the stitch quality. All right, so let's go after this again. We're going to stitch down these two layers of genuine elk hide. We only made a subtle adjustment on that upper tension to try to give us a little bit more pizzazz on the lock stitch because the lock stitch is a lot harder for this machine to generate because it's pulling that thread against gravity, against friction back up through those two thick layers of genuine elk hide. Okay. So all of that blah, blah, blah. Let's give us another run and see what we think. And again, I'm going to try to launch. I've got my hand over near the balance wheel. If we stall, because again, this needle has already gotten a big workout but I'm going to go after this again and see if we can do it without a hand start because that's a big deal when you're going through this much leather. All right, are you ready? Here we go. Notice I'm taking it slow too, for the most part. I'm not racing down and going pedal to the metal. All I'm doing is giving it enough gas to, to maintain the feed of that material going through. And you can see what we just laid down. 
it's only getting better and better and better. I'm actually liking the balance better on the look of this top stitch that would be on your left than the original one we did over here on the right. The spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch, the presentation of the stitch in this second row that we just did, where we took a little bit of the pull away from that bobbin case by increasing our upper tension, we actually, in my opinion, have even a better top stitch product than we did before. Because the problem is, if you've got too much pull down from that bobbin case, again, the bobbin case is pulling down to define the top stitch. The upper tension is pulling up to, to generate the lock stitch on the bottom. But if you get too much on either side, what it does is it compresses that stitch. It kind of pulls it too taut. And then you lose a little bit of the beauty and the flow of that stitch line. So our adjustment hopefully gave us a little bit better definition on the bottom, but it also gave us a better top stitch. It was an absolute win-win all the way around, all the way around. Very cool. So let me pull this through. And we're going to go ahead and flip it over and take a look at that lock stitch. You had a chance to already see the top stitch, which actually got even better. And now we're going to look at that lock stitch. Again, I didn't make a dramatic bump up on that upper tension. All I did was give it about another point. I took it from four to five. So it may not be quite enough, but we'll see. Let me back up a little bit and we'll take a look at this. Shut my little light off on here. But I can already see this second stitch line here. The lock stitch is definitely, definitely more pronounced than it was. Hopefully you can see that in the shot. Both of them are decent looking stitch lines through this much leather. Especially if I turn it, see how you see when I turn it on an angle a little bit and the light is hitting it properly. You can see those stitches popping much more with that subtle little adjustment that we made. Look at it like this too. See again on the end there, what we just sewed through without a hand start, without the benefit of a leather needle. We just went through about 14 ounces of genuine elk hide. And even before we made the adjustment, this again is our lock stitch on this side. Even before we made the adjustment, we had a really decent looking lock stitch. When you're managing this much leather with a non-leather needle, you don't expect to get results this good. But again, this machine went through a process that has it sewing better than when it left the factory. And the result is we get a beautiful, beautiful lock stitch. And we maintained our beautiful top stitch as well. If I were sewing a ton of two layers of elk hide, I would go up even a little bit higher than we did. I would go probably up to six or five and a half to maintain even a better lock stitch because you can see that the top stitch is just a tiny little bit more puppy than the lock stitch which for most people that are making leather products that's exactly what they're aiming for they want a decent lock stitch but the top stitch is their bread and butter their top stitch is what the customer is going to be looking at when they look at that leather product so we don't have a bad balance right now, but if I were sewing a ton of this to get that balance just absolutely spot on, I would bump up that upper tension even a little bit more than we did. So the rest of this space, I'm gonna leave for Kathy so that she can also have a chance to sew this leather when she gets it out in North Carolina. But isn't this fun to see? Because you can go into those Facebook groups, you can go into those Etsy groups and other places like that, and they'll be talking about needing to buy a four to $7,000 light industrial machine to sew leather like this. That's what they're going to tell you. You got to spend about seven grand, 
$7,000 on average, maybe more, to get a machine that can sew through this much leather. And we just did it multiple times. And with basic maintenance, basic lubrication on a machine like Kathy's, this is not a one-off. You can sew leather like this for a business out of your home or otherwise all day long. On a, on a Canadian 1591, a U.S. 1591, it doesn't matter. Because, again, one of the really cool attributes of this machine when it was introduced right around 1932 is they introduced a – it really wasn't new because it was on the 101. Mary, Mary Deegan's 101-4, remember the one that I just shipped out to Washington State? That had one of the earliest versions of the potted motor, gear-to-gear -gear traction, no belt. But as they moved into the 1591 in 1932, and then eventually moved to the 201-2 that I call the big brother of the 1591, the 201-2, the Rolls-Royce of Singers, they had perfected the potted motor so that it was delivering, even though it's only about 0.5 amps. You want to compare it in your mind, a featherweight comes with a 0.4 amp motor. But here's the thing about the featherweight. It's got that super long belt that goes down to the that output pulley on the motor, and then it goes all the way up over that balance wheel. You lose a lot of energy when you have a belt strapped like that on the machine. Not so on the 1591. You've got that gear to gear. The power goes directly from the motor right to that main shaft down to the needle bar, and then it hits leather like this, and it goes, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? So that was the really the, the, the amazing thing as they continued to perfect that potted motor, kind of reaching all the way back to the 1920s with the original 101-4, uh, which came out a little bit later in the 1920s. But nonetheless, it was brand new technology. And they just made it better with the 1591, and they continued to improve on it through the 201-2. And then you can do stuff like this that a lot of people in those sewing circles out there around the world, some who have not been in our classroom, would look at a sew-off like this and go, oh, so you used a light industrial machine to sew that much leather, right? You had to have used a light industrial machine maybe with a servo motor, right? Uh, no. No, we didn't. We didn't. We used Kathy Maddox's 1949 Singer 1591 made in, in Canada to go through leather like this without a hand start. Without a hand start. That to a lot of people is, it's almost like an urban myth. Until they watch a video like this that we live streamed and they go, holy crap. Sorry for saying that. Holy crap. It actually is possible. But then they sit down with their 1591 that has not gone through the workshop magic and they can't do it. And then they're like, all right, how did he do it? How did he do it? And how did he lay down stitching like that? <coughs> yeah. Workshop magic, folks. It's what we do, right? It's what we do. I got to get a drink of something. My throat's starting to get a little bit. A little bit wonky donkey here. I saw Paula here earlier uh, in the live chat, but I don't see her. I haven't seen her for a little bit, so I don't know. Paula was taking care of a friend, and I don't think I'm sharing anything incredibly private. I hope I'm not. But uh, Paula was taking care of a friend by the first name of Pat, that's facing some health challenges right now. And she said to me early this morning, she said, I might have to step away during the live stream or I might have to kind of mute myself a little bit as I'm helping to support this family. So, you know, we are a family, aren't we? We're a family. You have your own families, but we're kind of an extended family here. So keep uh, Paula's friend Pat in thought and prayer, if you don't mind me asking you to do that. And, uh, and hopefully everything works out okay with that family. So, yeah, I see us as a family, so we take care of each other, right? We care about each other. All right, so there's our single layer of Elkhide, which is kind of a laughable thing now. After we did this, you look at the two side by side. 
So let's move these to the side. All right, what do you guys want me to sew next? We've got more leather. We also have this other stack of all kinds of fun stuff. We've got the bubble gum material. <clears throat> We've got the uh, heavy grade denim. We've got this fake leather stuff that they used. It's like a naughty something or whatever that they would use to cover chairs and Davenports and couches back in the day. It was kind of the cheaper way to have a leather look on your furniture without paying for leather. Then we've got this really weird rubberized material that I got a roll of. It, it could be used for a variety of different applications. It's almost like a raincoat material, but a lot heavier. Let me move that camera down a little bit. I'm a little bit too high. Sorry about that. So let me, let me go over it again since I was too high. We've got the bubble gum material. We've got the denim. We've got the fake leather. We've got the raincoat rubberized material. We've got acrylic fiber, this stuff here that they make awnings out of. And then we've got uh, commercial upholstery material. So those are our off leather choices that we have. And then we have all these other leathers still that we can possibly sew. We've got uh, protected full grain leather, saddle grade leather, Italian leather, vegetable tan leather. This vegetable tan leather always sheds a lot. So I don't, I don't usually pull that out, but I, but I did in this case. So leathers and other fun stuff. You guys pick what you want us to sew next, and I'll go ahead and put that underneath the needle, okay? So I'm going to get another drink and then look at the chat, see what you guys are saying. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Susie. See, I wasn't watching the chat, so Paula must have typed that she had to step away, which I was kind of anticipating. So uh, thanks for letting me know that. See, that's why I love I love the fact that you guys are engaged and you step out of the shadows, you join the live chat. I can miss things as I'm trying to focus over here, and you guys can kind of get me back on track and say, hey, did you notice someone asked this question, or did you notice that so-and-so shared this? So thanks for doing that, you guys. I really appreciate it. Christina, Christina said, thank you. What did Christina say? Thank you about you guys lost me there. Are you, are we talking about Christina, Christina, our friend from, from, uh, Brazil, Christina from Brazil, or is it a different Christina, but I'm seeing rubberized material. So I'm going to go ahead and do the rubberized material next. <coughs> So you guys kind of see, it's not super thick, but I wish you could feel this stuff in your hand. It almost has an inlay, uh, like a scaliness that's below the sub-level of this stuff. And it's incredibly, incredibly strong stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do with this. You can make placemat settings. You could, gosh, I don't even know what you could do with all this, with this sort of rubberized material. Well, we're going to try to bust... I've got kind of a big piece, don't I? I've got a huge piece. Let me cut this down a little bit. I hate the waste material. Listen to this stuff cutting through. Give you an idea of how, how nasty this stuff is, to, or how, how nasty it's going to be to the needle. Listen to this stuff. These are sharp scissors, and they're struggling a little bit to get through this stuff. Let's throw that extra piece back there. So I think what we'll maybe do with this rubberized material is we'll kind of just, maybe we'll do like one of my little circles. How's that sound? We'll, we'll go around and do one of my little circles. We're not going to just do a single stitch line. We're going to kind of go down and around and around and around and around and around just for fun. Let me get the right shot for you guys. Okay. Thanks, Emma. So Emma clarified that our friend, uh, Christina from Brazil and that's the really neat thing. If you're brand new to this live stream and you're going, I don't know anything about cow country. I don't know anything about this Scott guy. I don't know anything about these other people. Uh, the fun thing about our classroom is it it's a magnet for people around the world that, that share our love of vintage sewing machines. So we get wonderful people like uh, Christina from Brazil. 
And when my moderators are available, uh, they'll try to jump in as best as they can and uh, use Google Translate to communicate with our friends that have come to join us. So they might be typing comments in uh, Portuguese for our friends in Brazil. They might be typing, uh, uh, you know, stit, uh, stitches. They might be typing. They might be typing stitches. They might be typing uh, comments back and forth in uh, Finnish, in Swahili, in German. Uh, we just have a, a big audience of friends that share our love and they like what we do here. So they come and join us, which is really, uh, that's a special thing, isn't it? I think it is. All right. So let's get ready to sew this nasty rubber material. We'll kind of go around and around and around and around. I'm going to put on a little bit of music to sew by because you, you've heard how silky smooth and beautiful Kathy Maddox's machine is, is stitching. It's just, it's just gliding through. Whatever we put in front of it so far, including two layers of Al-Qaeda that should have just killed it. And uh, and it's just, just plowing through this stuff, which is really fun. All right, let's get a little bit of music on. And we'll listen to a little bit of music while we're going around in circles here. <coughs> Kind of soft in the background. You can kind of hear it a little bit. All right. Let's have some fun here. It's kind of like being with kids, isn't it? Being with your grandkids, being with kids. And you're wanting to come up with some sort of a sophisticated game. And guess what? All they want to do is run around in a circle. That's all they want to do. So we're going to run around in a circle with Kathy Maddox's 1949 Canadian made 1591. Let's do it. Let's sew in a circle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll take it kind of slow. All right. Let me just trim these threads real quick. Get those out of the way. <coughs> All right. Let's keep sewing in a circle. Here we go. All right, I'll speed it up a little bit just for fun. So you guys can go, 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 go. And again, this is a rubberized material, so I'm kind of stretching it a little bit as I turn it. I'm just trying not to pull it too much so I don't end up. All right, I'm just going to keep going just for fun. I missed all this area out here. I'm just going to keep on stitching here. I'm going to really slow it down now so you can see you can harness back that power. All right, I'll stop there. All right, let's take a look at this stitching. And again, I don't know a lot about this rubberized material. I just know that it's it's really, really tricky stuff to sew. And again, we're sewing with a tiring needle. So here I kind of went over some of my stitching. That's okay. But you can look at most of the stitching down here around the outer rows in that. And we've got a beautiful looking top stitch. Again, sewing through this heavy rubberized type material. Try to get the right angle here. Let's flip it over and look at the lock stitching. And again, as you're changing through a wide field of different uh, materials, we may have to make adjustments on this uh, on this uh, 1591 to try to get a good stitch balance depending on the material that we're sewing. Here it looks like we might be a little bit weak, a little bit weak on that upper tension 
and that you know down here we've got some good stitch definition on that lock stitching but some of the other places is i was pulling that material to try to make those turns we might have to bump up that upper tension a little bit more to maintain a cleaner clear uh lock stitch Yeah, just so I would say just a little bit of a bump up on the upper tension if we were going to be sewing a ton of this stuff just to get it just right. But I'm really pleased that we made it through it and that we were able to generate a, a very, very decent looking stitch. So what do you guys want me to sew next? We've got a lot of leather choices. Again, if you're joining the live stream a little bit late, we've got protected full grain leather. We've got saddle grade leather. We've got Italian leather. We've got vegetable tan leather. And then we've got these other materials as well. We've got bubble gum material, uh, heavy grade denim, this uh, fake leather stuff, this naughty, whatever it's called. We've got this uh, acrylic fiber. And then finally, we've got this commercial upholstery material. So we've got a lot of choices of what we can sew it's just a matter of narrowing it down. So what do you guys think? So I'm not seeing anybody chiming in as far as picking materials. So I'm just going to pick something. I think we'll move over to some denim. Denim is something that's commonly sewed by most sewers at one time or another, even if it's just for mending. So I've got this. Uh, this is the, you guys have seen me sew that other denim that's kind of got a, uh, it's kind of like a stretch denim and it's got like a, a vinyl in it. So it, you pull it and it almost looks like bubble gum material. This is more of a standard denim. So we're starting with two layers of this. If I go ahead and fold it in half, we're up to four layers. And then if I fold it one more time, we're up to eight layers of heavy grade denim. Now, I don't know about you, but the average sewer is not likely to have to go up to eight layers of denim. It's not likely. Even if they're sewing like bib overhauls or something like that, it's not likely to be quite this thick. You can see how thick that is. So that's what we're going to be doing next with this Canadian uh, 1591 from 1949. So let's give it a go. And again, the 1591s in general have some really good presser foot clearance. Now, what a lot of people don't know about the 1591 is that you can also drop the feed dogs on this model. There's a little thumb screw on the bottom. You loosen it up, rotating it towards you, and then you can manually lower those feed dogs, do free motion quilting, do free hand embroidery, and then you can just raise that those feed dogs back up manually, tighten that thumb screw again, and then you're back in business again with full uh, feed dog power. So, but my, my point is, if you get into a bind where you're trying to go through eight layers of heavy grade denim, and you can't quite get it underneath the presser foot. And on the 1591, there's really not a lot in the way. There's some hyperextension. See the hyperextension right there working? But if that's not even enough, you can always lower the feed dogs temporarily, get that material underneath the presser foot, and then raise those feed dogs back up again. Just a little trick to try to get better clearance. Okay? All right, so let's see if we can go through this now eight layers of heavy grade denim eight layers of heavy grade denim i'm really starting to push this to 9014 universal needle to the to the point of almost giving up because i did a lot of off camera sewing we've already done a fair amount of on camera sewing including all of that elk hide so hopefully we can get the rest of these sew offs done using this same needle i've got a lot of confidence 
and Schmetz. A lot of confidence. All right, here we go. We'll take up arms at the highest position. Let's see if we can get through these eight layers of heavy grade denim. Let me move that camera just a little bit closer. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let me cheat a little bit here and see if I can put a clamp on there, at least initially. All right, here we go. You see it hit that? Did you see it hit that denim? Our needle's starting to get a little bit dull. It hit that denim and it pushed through, but it, it hit that like, are you serious? Are you serious? See, I should have kept that clamp on there. I kind of let it come apart a little bit, didn't I? Oh, well. All right, so again, if you missed it somehow, what do we just stitch through? We just stitch through that much denim. That much denim, eight layers of denim. And I, I probably should have given it a hand start, I didn't. So when that needle hit that denim, it was like, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? Now let's look at that stitching. Here's our top stitching right here. Absolutely gorgeous stitching. Again, through eight layers of heavy gray denim. Look at that lock stitch. Lock stitch is always a little bit harder to generate for a sewing machine. It's a little bit hard to see that, isn't it? Let me turn it on the side so you can see it more easily. Trying to get the right angle. Bear with me for a second here. It almost looks like we made a pillow, doesn't it? So again, what do we sew through? Eight layers of heavy grade denim. No hand start. And the machine did a, an excellent job in laying down some gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. We're getting a little bit of a dullness to that needle, so it's not going to be quite as sharp as it would be if we were starting with an absolutely fresh needle. And that really is a good practice when you're sewing. You want to keep a fresh needle in the machine. But when it comes to these sewing Olympics, I'm really wanting to press that machine to have to perform in spite of a less than ideal setup. And the less than ideal setup is a... You know, we've already sewn a bunch of heavy grade leather using this needle. We've already sewn a bunch of stuff off camera. 
but I'm still wanting this machine to perform nonetheless. So, and it's doing, in my opinion, it's doing a very, very good job of getting the job done. But again, if we were going to be sewing at this level with uh, heavy grade denim all day long, you would have to look at some sort of tension adjustments to get it just right. Plus, you would want to be using a denim needle, uh, ideally, because of the scarf and the uh, shaft design and everything else on a denim needle is going to be a little bit more favorable to a, a woven type material like this versus a universal needle. So you just have to take into account when you're sewing at this level for a single sew off, you can you can get away with it. But if you're going to be sewing denim all day long, you'd, you'd be wanting to use a denim needle. You'd be wanting to use uh, a setup that's more suitable for this type of material. You just would. Yeah. But I'll tell you one thing. There's not a lot of machines out there, 1591s, that can sew through eight layers of denim like this. So what have we sewn so far? What have we done so far? Hundred percent cotton. We only do two rows of that. One right around six stitches per inch. One right around fifteen to twenty stitches per inch. We also sewed this off camera as I was getting the machine fine tuned. More hundred percent cotton. We sewed through this uh, hundred percent uh, genuine elk hide. A single layer of it and then also a double layer of it as well we just did these eight layers of denim and then we did this rubberized raincoat type material as well kind of sewed around in a circle as i'm pulling it and trying to get that material to to feed the direction that i want to feed it so we put it all together this is what we've done so far on this machine, on camera and off camera. Not a bad, not a bad test of the machine, but we're not done yet. And again, I want to give you more choice in picking the material order that we do before we finally wrap up this live stream. So again, kind of throwing it out to you. You can make the choice. We've got bubble gum material. We've got this fake leather stuff. We've got this acrylic fiber that's used for awnings. We've got this commercial upholstery material. And then we have these leathers left over here. Protected full grain leather is the blue stuff. Saddle grade leather, Italian leather, and vegetable tan leather. So you can make the choice. Otherwise, I'll pick something that we sew next. It's up to you. But I like to involve you folks in uh, the decisions that we do during these live streams so that we can have that opportunity to interact together. So Christina from Brazil, from what Emma is sharing, would like to see more leather sewing, which is totally cool. So I think what we'll do now is we'll do some protected full grain leather. I'll do a single layer of that. And again, what I'm going to try to do, and I might fail at it. You guys know that sometimes I miss some mark and I don't do any editing. Uh, I'm going to try to go around this protected full grain leather. It's probably about three ounces of leather. And I'm going to try to navigate around all these little turns. It might require raising the presser foot, but I'm going to see if I can stitch around that outer area and stay as close to the edge as I can within reason within reason all right let's start right about there <laughs> so this is again protected full grain leather protected full grain leather like uh, elk hide is chemically processed that's why they call it protected full grain leather and they do that because they want to make the leather more durable they also want to make it re resistant to staining 
What that translates to in the end, as soon as you chemically treat something, is it galvanizes the surface of that leather and it makes it more difficult for a needle to pierce through it, especially a needle that's getting a little bit tired. So we're going to try to maintain stitch integrity as I'm navigating around these turns. And then we'll take a look at that stitching and see what we think. Okay. So let me get that take up arm at the highest position. I'm going to try to start a little bit more music for us. There's some soft music in the background. It almost has kind of an Italian sound to it, doesn't it? Or a Spanish sound. I love this music with guitars, don't you? All right, let's start navigating around this protected full grain leather. See how well I can steer and harness back that power. This machine has a lot of power now after all of my work, but you still have to be able to control that power, don't you? So let's see what we think. All right, here we go. All right, I'm going to stop right about there. Hopefully, I didn't go too far. Raise our presser foot, make this turn. And you can already get a pre-glimpse. You can already get a pre-glimpse of that stitching over here. I think you can see it. Let me get a little bit closer. Folks, that is some gorgeous stitching. It just is. Again, we're not using a leather needle. We're not using a leather needle. I'm really pulling that kind of hard. I probably shouldn't be pulling it that hard, but I'm trying to see if I could keep a nice fluid flow around some of those little edges. I'm going to cheat and raise that presser foot just temporarily, though. All right, let's give us a go. Let me clip these real quick. So again, this is protected full grain leather. Let's see how we do around this corner here. Uh, I'm going to keep trying to go. I'm going to keep trying to go. All right, here I'm uh, here I'm going to I'm going to wave the white flag and see if I can get back in that little corner over there. All right, here we go. Let's see how we did. All right, that's where I'm going to stop right there. That's where I'm going to stop. And obviously, when you're trying to sew around edges like this, and you're trying to meter out that power, um, and you've got a, a needle that's already gotten a pretty good workout, we might see a couple of variances as far as that stitch quality. But all in all, what I'm seeing right now is just absolutely breakworthy. And again, protected full grain leather is not the easiest leather to sew either. I haven't used this during the entire live stream. Let me actually get this little stitch displayer thing set up and we'll take a look at these straight on. i shut off that little light. Now there's what I like to call the totality of the stitching. The totality of the stitching means that we're looking at all of the stitching as a tapestry. And the easiest play to, place to see the stitching is where you've got these straight lines right up here, uh, right over here as well on the bottom. And what I'm seeing, and you can tell me if you see something else, but I am seeing stitching that is absolutely spot on page 34. I'm seeing stitches where the spacing, the integrity the presentation of the stitch is exactly exactly what we want to be seeing in spite of my less than perfect technique of navigating around the edges um, the machine did an outstanding job of laying down some gorgeous page 34 stitching and again we can improve on this by having a fresh needle preferably a leather needle but we're, we're using the setup that we have, and we're just going to press through. 
because this is the sewing Olympics during this live stream, and we're not going to be changing out needles. Unless the needle breaks, then we don't have any choice. But I'm really pleased with how Kathy's machine managed this stitching on this protected full grain leather. Let's turn it over, look at the lock stitching, see what we think of that. Lock stitch stitching is always going to be just a little bit more tricky for machine uh, to be able to execute effectively. And yet here, let me set this camera down and I'll actually grab this material. Here is I kind of pull the, the, the leather back a little bit. Tilt that down a little bit more. Here's I pull the leather back a little bit. You can really get a glimpse of just how beautiful how beautiful that lock stitching in fact is. And again, this is a non-leather needle that we're sewing with. And yet it's maintaining a stitch integrity that is absolutely what, what we want to be seeing. Now we're going to have this long line of stitching here. I don't even think I have to pull this back. I can just bring it past the camera. And you're going to be able to see how beautifully Kathy's machine did in executing once it focuses. <laughs> once it focuses, it's like, okay, I'm not ready to focus yet. There we go. I'm kind of having to look over my shoulder as I'm doing this so that I can make sure that I'm keeping in focus while I'm trying to show this stitching. So what did we accomplish here? Number one, we accomplished harnessing that power back with this potted motor on this machine that has a lot of get up and go now. Secondly, we were successful in being able to show that it can maintain the stitch quality even as it's navigating around uh, these tighter turns that we we're trying to do. And again, we're not using a leather needle. We're not using a special roller foot or a walking foot. We're simply putting the material down there and going after it. So I'm going to give this a definite pass. Top stitch, lock stitch is exactly, exactly what we want to be seeing with a sew off like this. All right, let me set that to the side. Let's do another material that we haven't done yet, whether it's leather or some other type of material that we have available. Let me set this to the side. So we've got, we've got this bubble gum material. We've got this uh, fake leather material. It has a really interesting, almost an upholstery backing on it, doesn't it? We've got this acrylic fiber. And then last but certainly not least, we've got this commercial upholstery material. And then we've got all the leathers that I've shown you multiple times. We've got, um, we're not going to do any more protected full grain leather right now, I don't think, unless I folded it in half and did two layers of it, which I could certainly consider doing. We got this saddle grade leather, Italian leather, and then this vegetable tan leather as well. So what are you guys thinking? And hopefully it's someone other than Emma, maybe Susie or one of the other folks in the uh the live stream. What do you want to see me sew next with Kathy's 1949 Canadian made 1591? 
what uh, Susie is uh, making a suggestion relating to settings. Can you clarify what that is? What is the what is the idea on the settings as far as so off? <laughs> Susie, can you clarify what you're looking for? Just so I understand. And while you're clarifying that, let me ask, let me ask folks to reinforce learning again. When was the Singer 1591 first introduced? What year? What year was the Singer 1591 first introduced? The model that we're working with today out of Canada was made much later than the original 1591s. Do you just, uh, do you have that plastic material awning material? I think you're talking about acrylic fiber, Susie. Are you talking about this stuff right here is the um, is the awning material panel. Is that what you're talking about? This this awning material here? I refer to it as acrylic fiber. It's got a real dense weave to it and it's used for making awnings it's stretched over metal frames it's exposed to light it's exposed to high winds and everything like that and because of its composition it stands up against all of that stuff and continues to do its job as an awning so is this what you're looking for or are you talking about this rubberized material that i stitched on before this stuff here that it's almost like a matte material uh or I think I refer to it as maybe a raincoat material, but this probably this probably gonna be a little bit too heavy for a raincoat, unless it's a super serious type raincoat. So is this the stuff, Susie, that you're interested in seeing sewn next? This acrylic fiber. We can go through a couple layers of this stuff with a 1591. Just, just clarify, Susie, if you would. Is this, this is the stuff you want to see, and uh, are you wanting me to uh, try to sew this one next? I'm wait, I'm kind of waiting on Susie's response. I think this is what she wants me to try stitch, stitching next with Kathy's machine, but I just want to make sure. Okay, so let's do this for extra fun. Let's do this for extra fun, just to show the, the strength and the determination of this 1591. I'm going to take this raincoat material, and I'm going to use it almost like a quilter would use batting. I'm going to put this rubberized material in the middle, like so, and then I'm going to wrap this acrylic fiber around it like that. So not only are we going through two layers of acrylic fiber, which is like, I mean, you could, it's like a Kevlar material. It's like a crazy Kevlar material. I've sent a couple samples of this out to people that actually reached out and said, could you send me a sample of that acrylic fiber? And I've done it. So if you want to reach out and say, Hey, can you send me a small little sample of that acrylic fiber? I'll do that. So you can try it on your machine and realize just how, how difficult this stuff is. But we're not going to go through just two layers of this acrylic fiber. We're going to add this raincoat rubberized material to the middle of it, almost like a quilter would use uh, quilt batting. And we're going to go through all three layers of this with Kathy's machine. But I'm not going to be so crazy as to try to go around in a circle on this. I'm going to cut this down just a little bit, and we'll do one or two stitch lines down it, okay? Let's do that. I'm going to almost cut this right down the middle. That way I can use it again. Folks, I wish you could feel these scissors trying to go through this stuff right now.
It's like cutting. It's like cutting wood. Holy mackerel. That's insane. All right. I can use either one of these sides. It really doesn't matter. I might trim back that rubberized material a little bit and use this one next. You get that nice and even. Listen to that stuff. Just that rubberized material. All right, let's get this underneath the presser foot with what is a quickly tiring needle and see if we can get this done too. And I actually stepped it up higher than Susie from Minnesota was asking me to do. She wanted to see the acrylic fiber sewn because it's nasty, wicked stuff that's used to make awnings. But I actually decided, you know what? I'm going to step it up even further. I'm going to do two layers of this acrylic fiber awning material. Plus, I'm going to add this nasty rubberized material to the middle of it, almost like a batting. So we'll see how this machine does. We'll go down with a stitch line of probably six or seven stitches per inch. And then we're, and I'm actually going to bump up our upper tension just a little bit. Uh, then we're going to go down it again with a stitch line of about 15 to 20 stitches per inch going down this same material. So we're going from crazy to crazy, crazy. Let's give us a try. Oh, bye, Christina. All right, let's give this a try. No hand start. We're just going to jump into it. Look at that. That needle hit that acrylic fiber and it just stopped. You just saw it. It just hit that and stopped. That gives you an idea of what we're trying to stitch through at this point. So I'm going to give it a little bit of a hand boost. And it just goes to show you a material doesn't have to be crazy thick to be crazy difficult to stitch through. That's what acrylic fiber is all about. It's got a weave that is so tight to make it uh, be able to stand up against winds and heat and cold and everything else that to try to get through this stuff, when you add the element of that rubberized material as well, we're trying to do probably the toughest sew off that we've done so far, even a little bit tougher than that elk hide. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a little bit of a help and then we'll try stitching down this. I hope we can make it through it with this needle that's starting to show a lot of fatigue. All right, here we go. Holy mackerel. I'm seeing some beautiful stitching, top and bottom. But I'll tell you, it wasn't without a little bit of extra effort on our part. Holy mackerel. Acrylic fiber, Jiminy Crickets. And then throwing that rubber in the middle of the mix, it's just insane. It's just utterly insane. <coughs> All right, now let's shorten that stitch up to about 15 to 20 stitches per inch, and we'll go down another stitch line. So I'm going to shorten up that stitch. Let's see if we can do it this time. I'm going to give it a little bit more gas and see if we can make it through this time without it hitting that acrylic fiber and just stopping. We might hit it again and it might just stop. It just shows you how nasty this stuff is. All right, here we go again. Row number two. This time we're doing about 15 stitches per inch, 15 to 20. Here we go. Gave it a little bit more gas that time. Can you hear the machine working though? It's actually working harder to execute the sewing on this acrylic fiber and rubberized material than it has on any other sew off that we've done during this live stream. You can actually hear that potted motor just digging into it. You know what I mean?
That's why I love doing the sewing Olympics for these live streams and premieres. I don't want to just sew one material and get it done. I want us to go through all kinds of interesting fabrics and materials and really, really step away from that machine saying, you know what? We did our job. We did our job and put that machine through the paces and really, really, oh my goodness, those are beautiful stitches. I don't know if you can see that already from this angle. So we did a little bit longer stitch the first time. The lock stitch isn't quite as defined as I'd like it. But when we shorten that stitch, again, the, the, the wider spans you put between each stitch, just like when you're laying down zigzags, it's going to make that tension uh, stressed a little bit more than when you're putting the stitches closer together. So here I'm seeing a little bit weaker lock stitch than I'd like to be seeing. But on both stitch rows, on that top stitch, we absolutely nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. I think you can see that in the shot. At least I can on the screen. You can see just how beautiful that stitching is. And again, we stepped it up even higher than Susie asked us to. Susie wanted to see the acrylic fiber. I gave her the acrylic, acrylic fiber plus this rubberized material as well. Beautiful stitching. And on the back as well, we've got a decent lock stitch, but we could tighten it up even a little bit more. Here we're looking pretty solid. We've got the solid points going all the way down. Uh, but again, the lock stitch is always going to be a little bit harder to execute. And on this lock stitch, it might be a little bit easier to see it from the edge, like I showed you with those other stitches, too. <laughs> but I would definitely bump up that upper tension just a little bit to make that lock stitch even more pronounced. I mean, we're going through some really, really difficult material. We're going through the acrylic fiber, two layers of that, plus a rubberized material. So as you're trying to pull that thread back up through all of this, you need just a little bit more boost. But I'm really pleased with the outcome of that. The machine managed it very well. And this is what, with the exception of just one of the stitch offs in here, this is all that we did on this live stream today. I think that's a fair test of this machine. I really do. But we might just do one or two more sew offs. And I know our, 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 our run time is getting a little bit long. Folks have other things to do. Uh, it's a busy, I don't even know what day of the week it is. I think it's Wednesday. It's a busy Wednesday for folks. But I know you guys love seeing this. So I might just do one more, one or two more sew-offs as we wrap this up. And I, you guys know I love this saddle grade leather. So maybe we'll jump back towards the leather a little bit and we'll do some of that next. And you can see the saddle grade leather, it doesn't have a real dense, uh, it doesn't have a real dense nap on the back. It's a fairly clean leather, but we're going to make it even easier to see that stitching. So I'm going to go ahead and fold it in half and get us up to two layers of this saddle grade leather. You can kind of see it from the side there. And this is what we're going to sew next. We'll go, maybe we'll go down and around on this. And maybe I'll use those, I'll use some clamps to try to hold it together a little bit more easily. I'm also going to bump up. I talk about this a lot when it comes to feeding and maintaining stitch integrity. Also, when you're going through um, a leather sew off like this, where we're not doing two separate layers that are cut down the edge, here we're folding it over so it's creating a little bit more of a, a challenge when it comes to stitching through this because there's a tension on the leather right now as we're folding it over. So I'm going to bump up that presser foot pressure just a little bit. Give us a little bit more of an edge in trying to feed this evenly. All right, let's go down this saddle grade leather. I'm kind of tempted to use a clamp on it. 
a little clip to try to hold it together a little bit more easily before I get down the stitch line a little bit. I think I'll probably do that. So let's go down this saddle grade leather now and see how uh, this 1591 manages this. Again, we've got a non-leather needle in the machine, and the needle has really been given quite a workout. You know what I mean? It's been given quite a workout. So we're kind of pushing our good fortune here with Schmetz, but I think Schmetz is up to the task. So here goes two layers of saddle grade leather. Let's see how Kathy's machine does managing this. All right, here we go. I'm kind of slipping off track here a little bit. I'm going to move my clamp down to here now. Try to hold that over a little bit if I can. All right. So I laid down my stitch line with a larger stitch. Now we're going to try to lay down a stitch line next to this with a much shorter stitch. So we're really going to be pressing that oscillating hook to try to complete that stitch process very rapidly as we're going down with a much tighter stitch length, much tighter. All right, let me clip that real quick. And I'm going to try to wrap this up pretty quick because I know it's it's run a little bit longer than I expected. And I didn't even show you the progress shots. But again, you can go to Facebook and look at those. And I'll also try to remember putting the, uh, the description into uh, this particular live stream where you can see the links to those shots as well. I'm going to try to leave a little bit of space for Kathy so she can potentially sew this as well. And of course, before I ship this machine out to North Carolina, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put a fresh needle in this as well so that Kathy will be starting out with uh, a fresh needle. This needle is, uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed by Schmetz. You guys know that. Uh, but I'll tell you one thing. Sometimes I really push these. I get to a point of what Sonny calls uh, needle abuse, needle abuse. Okay, so I haven't even shown you. I've kind of talked about it. Here's our stitch length controller right over here. There it is. Our stitch length controller. You see we're right in the seven, six to seven range right now. I'm going to go ahead and slide it up. Get us up to right around 15, probably around 15 stitches per inch right in that range. So we're not at the max. We could go all the way down to 30. As, as long as you stay below this line right here. Uh, you're still going to be stitching forward. On the 1591, if you go above that line, you've got a range of stitching you can do here in reverse. And that's really a cool thing about machines that give you that capability. Some stitches, some machines, when they stitch in reverse, they're going to go with a default, usually about probably close to 10 stitches per inch. On this 1591, you can adjust that stitch length so you can actually set what reverse stitching you want to do as far as locking that stitch off. So that's kind of cool. All right, so we're right about there, 15 stitches per inch. Let's go over here and do our final, probably our final sew off, unless you guys really clamor and say, hey, we want to watch, we want to watch you sew this. But if you guys don't clamor, I'm probably going to stop on this stitch off here. All right. So two layers of saddle grade leather. Try to get that camera set up just so you can see it nice and clear as those stitches are being laid down. There we go. There we go. I like that. Yeah. Nice clear shot. You can just see that stitch line is just gorgeous. So let's see if we can lay down now about 15 stitches per inch through two layers of saddle grade leather. You're talking about probably about eight ounces of leather. Eight ounces of leather. All right. Here we go. You hear that? That's a needle that's getting tired. That's a needle that's getting tired when it hits that saddle grade leather and it goes, ah, no. Wow. Look at that stitching, y'all. I 
I love leather. You guys know that. And when you can wrap up a live stream like this, where this machine has been run through a diverse field of sew-offs and has continued to perform very, very well, and we can wrap it up with a sew off on two layers of saddle gray leather like this. And not just two layers of saddle gray leather, but saddle gray leather that we folded over. So there's a tension on that leather that makes that sew off even more difficult. Uh, that's a great way to end a celebration. And that's the way I look at live streams and premieres is it's a celebration to, to get to that finish line where a machine has gone through a lot of servicing in the workshop. And then we can celebrate the performance of that machine. Seeing if I probably want to set this up on that sew off holder. I probably do. And I know others, others that have to step away will probably watch this afterwards, and that's okay. But here you can see, as I get a little bit closer to these, that is solid, solid page 34 stitching. The spacing, the formation, both on the top row, that's about six or seven stitches per inch. And then on our lower row as well. We're right around 15 stitches per inch. Beautiful, beautiful stitching on the part of this Canadian 1591. Turn it over. As I turn it over, I'll kind of lean it towards the camera a little bit so you can see the thickness of what we went through again. Right around six to eight ounces of leather. Not an easy sew off at all. So here's our lock stitch now. Lock stitch is always going to be a little bit harder to execute. And it, yet, as you can see, as that needle passed through and kind of pushed, it creates almost like a little nub between each of the stitch rows, the longer stitches. Uh, we've got an absolute gorgeous stitch outcome through these two layers of saddle gray leather. And again, the, the lock stitch is always going to be a trickier stitch to generate than the top stitch because of that factor of pulling that thread back up through these layers against gravity and friction and everything else. And yet this 1591 just knocked it out of the park. It just knocked it out of the park. I'm going to even lift that up a little bit so I can get even a little bit closer, hopefully. Folks, I'm just going to say it. Don't rush out now after you've seen what this 1591 from Canada is able to do and go, oh, I want a machine that can do that and expect that 1591 to do this. It didn't go through the workshop magic. It's not going to be able to deliver at this level. And this is only one of the sew-offs that we've done show you guys again just to remind you especially if you join the live stream late you stepped away you came back whatever you know saddle grade i'll save that one for last because that was our last sew off this crazy acrylic fiber that i stuck the rubberized material in between we did that protected full grain leather two layers of uh genuine elkide single layer of elkide This was off camera, 100% cotton. I did several rows of that. Eight layers of heavy grade denim. This rubberized material by itself, we kind of went around in circles and I really pressed the machine to try to uh, control that. And then finally I did these on the live stream today, these two rows on this 100% cotton. I should probably just put that on the bottom. 100% cotton uh, sew off as well. And then last but not least, we did this saddle grade leather. So, you know, this is, this is what the real deal looks like when it comes to testing a machine.
the real deal of this many sew offs, the majority of which, with the exception of only one, were done on this live stream. You could witness them. You could listen to the machine. You could see where the machine was hitting something that was really, really difficult to pierce through, and that needle would just stop. That's not something I edit out because I want you guys to understand that we don't have the ideal setup here. We went through leather, denim. We went through acrylic fiber. We went through rubberized raincoat material. We went through 100% cotton, and this was all with a universal size 9014 needle and that dual duty thread that we have. So you know what? If we had gone with a leather needle, we may have been able to press this machine even further. But I'm incredibly impressed with how this machine has performed. And I would strongly encourage you. I know that you're busy, folks, but you'll want to check out the description and or go to the Cow Country Facebook page to look at those 300 plus progress shots that I took this machine through so you can appreciate what the process is. It's unlike any process in the world. And it makes all the difference in the world of what a machine is able to do when you go from Bob and the balance wheel and you go at a surgical level with a machine. So all of that blah, blah, blah. Unless you really want to see something else sewn, um, I think we're done. So I'm going to set that stack of sew offs that we did right there. Actually, I'll kind of back up the camera a little bit so you can see the machine a little bit, a little bit better, I think. But again, these Canadian made 1591s are really fabulous machines. If you come across one and the seller, like in many instances, is willing to send the machine directly to the workshop so I can go through it and give it the workshop magic. The last thing I want you to do is I, I, last thing I want you to do is to see a machine like this that has just really done a fantastic job and then get the same make and model and then be disappointed. And that all comes down to how that machine has been prepared. So hopefully you'll take that advice and uh, oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. The stitching is, the stitching is, is really quite fabulous, isn't it? It's quite fabulous. And again, the, the universal needle is able to manage leather pretty well, not quite as well as a leather needle, but um, the machine has done a great job even though the setup is an ideal. So at any rate, our, our flock, because this has gone a little bit over two hours, uh, has dwindled down to the, the final faithful folks, which I believe is probably Emma and Susie. So kudos to you ladies for sticking out until the end and uh, for uh, being a part of this experience to celebrate uh, this great Canadian machine that's heading now to to uh, to North Carolina, and I don't know a thing. Of, I don't know a thing about Clemens, North Carolina, but I'm sure it's a very nice place, based on uh, my contact with Kathy Maddox. So, there you go. Oh, I know what else I wanted to show you real quick, and and it's for the benefit of others that'll watch this live stream afterwards. Is uh, the bobbin that this machine came with is this one right here, which is actually not. It's not the correct bobbin for this 1591. This is actually a German bobbin that would work in a FOF 130 or in a, um, a FOF 130-6. Interestingly, the dimensions of it are real close to the class 15 bobbin. And so I probably could have run with this, but I knew it wasn't the right bobbin, even though the dimensions were real close. It's a little bit larger in its girth, and so it would have just stuck out a minuscule amount from the bobbin case, which could have caused some issues with the thread snagging. So I decided to put this one back in the bag along with the uh, mounting clamps for Kathy, and then I just threw in a, a Class 15 bobbin that she can use. So, yeah, be aware of that. When you get a machine, when you get a machine, the bobbin and other things that have been done to the machine could change what that machine was like originally. So you got to kind of look for that. You got to kind of look for that. All right. Did I, did I miss sewing any of these materials over here that you guys were really determined to want to see uh, the fake leather, the bubble gum material, the upholstery material, or any of these leather types that I did not. sew? we did sew the protected. So I'm going to throw that to the side, but we didn't sew the uh, Italian 
and we didn't sow the vegetable tan. So before I end the live stream for you faithful two ladies that stuck it out until the very end, uh, is there any last final, let's just do one more sew off. Or if you're content, you can either give a smiley face, a thumbs up, or you can just say, no, no, man, this, this is more than a fair test of this machine. And we should just wrap up the live stream. What do you guys think? All right. So Susie's good. I'm guessing Emma's probably good as well. I think we covered the bases. We could have done a couple more sew-offs. We don't have to. We went above and beyond what most people would do to consider a machine ready to, to go to that owner. So I'm going to put on a little bit of music. If you ladies want to chat and wrap things up real quick. Um, that's a good question. Um, there are different options in closed caption uh, for different languages, but I don't know what YouTube offers. And I don't know if it's like keyboards when someone is in another country and they're typing on the keyboard, uh, they're typing obviously with their alphabet, with their, their language, whatever it is on their keyboard, their letters and stuff and their characters. So with closed caption, I don't know if it's going to adapt to their origin of country or not. Uh, that's a great question. Um, if someone wants to do some research and see if they can find that out, that would be cool. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think we gave a fair test to this machine. I agree, Emma. Um, you know, whether, whether it's someone that really wants to get a 1591 and use it for leather sewing, I think we demonstrated that. I think we demonstrated the practical side of the denim, the cotton, uh, with the stiffener in the middle, kind of like the quilt batting, acrylic fiber. I mean, I think I think we gave a fair run uh, to this Canadian machine. So I'm going to put on some music. If you ladies want to wrap up, share a couple of comments with each other. And I don't know if anyone ever typed into the chat or not when the 1591 was first introduced, but the answer is 19, 1932. So that's going back a long ways. And you guys know from other classes, the 1591 is way down, way down the line as far as class 15 machines that Singer made well before this machine was ever conceived of. A long, and I've gone on that list before. I'm not going to do it right now. So, Well, thank you again to, to Susie and uh, Emma uh, for sticking it out until the very end. And uh, I know Kathy will see this. Uh, she's working right now, I believe, so she can't. She couldn't join the live stream. But I think she's going to have a lot of fun with this machine, a lot of fun. And uh, my next step now will be to spend the time to pack it up and get it safely out to uh, North Carolina. So you guys take care and have a great rest of the day.